He will talk about system D journaling and yeah, he will explain it to you. Have fun. Microphone, yeah. Yeah. Have fun and enjoy. Yeah, you have to stay Hi. here because of the camera. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So it's Good. Um, yeah, I figure this talk is fairly technical and uh, very Linux-ish, software-ish. Um, but yeah, so um, uh, I can do this talk in English or I can do it in German, depending on what you want to, uh, what you prefer. My native tongue is German, not English. So anybody here wants it in English? You want an English? Okay, so it's in English. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about the system journal today. Um, Let's uh, start though with a, a very short introduction about Systemd. I'm pretty sure at least if you, if you ha have, are in contact with Linux, you probably have heard of uh, Systemd before. Systemd is uh, uh, the system and service manager of uh, most of today's Linux distributions. Um, like system and service manager is a fancy um, explana uh, like expression that uh, it used to be called simply the init system, but since we do more than just the init system, um, I tend to prefer to call it the system and service manager. It's kind of the glue that sits between um, the kernel and the applications and tries to keep everything together on the operating system. Um, if you have any um, remotely current Linux of any of the more popular distributions, you have it on your computer right now. Um, yeah. And part of systemd is uh, a component called the systemd journal. The systemd journal is respons responsible for logging. Um, so um, this, like, I think most people, um, uh, like this, this talk is intended for people who have been uh, uh, playing with the lower parts of the operating system and uh, um, would like to know more about um, this specific detail of the lower um, components of the operating system. So the systemd journal, um, as mentioned, is, is about logging. It's uh, built right into systemd, so um, if you have Linux, you have systemd, and if you have systemd, you have the journal on your computer. So uh, yeah, um, of course we have had uh, logging systems on Linux since pretty much Linux exists, right? Classic syslog, um, and then it was replaced by syslog and g and r syslog and these kind of things. So uh, with the the journal is like from a from a from a distant perspective kind of same thing, but it's also very different from that. Um, it replaces in a way um, classic syslog, r syslog, syslog and g, but it can also work in conjunction with it. Um, how that works, we'll talk about uh, later. Uh, oh, by the way, I've uh, I know that I'm talking very fast. If I'm talking too fast, just say something. And uh, if you have any questions, completely interrupt me right away. I much prefer if we can make this interactive than me just talking here. And uh, yeah, so the, uh, I kind of always hope that people ask a lot of questions because the slides that I have here are not the main focus of my talks. It's your questions if you have any. So interrupt me. Anyway. So uh, um, coming back to what the difference between the journal and classic syslog is there. Um, one of the primary goals we had with uh, uh, the journal was that we really want to collect everything, like collect all the logs happening on the system, and it really means everything. That means stuff um, that is generated while the kernel boots up, that stuff that uh, um, happens in the earliest stages of boot, like uh, in the initial RAM disk, and the early boot process, and the late boot process, and during runtime. It also means, of course, um, the stuff that happens during shutdown. So we really try much harder than syslog traditionally did that, um, to collect logs from the entire runtime of the system. Because, uh, well, obviously, um, most, many of the issues that you have on your computer are involved, uh, like are caused by the boot process, hence we should provide the best logging there. Um, of course, traditionally on syslog, that wasn't that way, actually, because on, on syslog um, was a late boot service, um, and basically meant that, yeah, it would get everything that was um, logged during late boot, but it would get pretty much nothing um, that was happening during early boot, including your file system checks and things like that. So. Um, yeah, for us it really matters that we really cover everything because we think that's our duty. Um, but of course, like if you used um, uh, systems before um, uh, systemd in the journal, you did get early boot logs too. But the way they implemented that most of them is by actually um, scraping the contents of the console at boot time um, uh, instead of actually, yeah, um, doing it the other way around. That's the question. I switched off my computer into hibernation uh, last night. When I woke up this morning at 4 o'clock, I switched it on, and what I got was only a blinking cursor at the top left. Nothing more. I switched off and uh, 
switched on again and then I could boot normally. So I wonder, you said everything is collected. What uh, I checked is the system D um, control, um, journal control. Mm -hmm. saw, uh, and you missed nothing, uh, the first. Okay, so there's always, of course, the problem that uh, um, when the system hangs um, and it hangs completely, then there's no time to ever write that on disk. So while we collect um, everything, of course, there's a chance that we might not be able to write it on disk. If the system's completely host and the hard disk driver doesn't work and, and you can't talk to the hardware, then, then you lost, basically. Then there need to be other ways to debug this. But we provide ways to do that. Like, for example, if anything that, that hits um, the journal at all, you can option forward to a serial port or, or, or the screen um, in case you don't want to rely on the hardest for that kind of stuff. Oh, that's kind of an answer. Um, okay, collecting everything not only means that we do that during the entire time the system is booting and shutting down and, and running, but it also means from um, almost all sources that we have that log anything on the system. So um, the journal actually collects syslog information, like tra traditional syslog, which is what daemons on the system log. It um, also means that uh, we uh, collect standard output, standard er error of daemons, like so they, if they just use printf or something like that to log something, that it ends up in the... In the, in the logs for all services on the system. Um, audit, I'm not sure if you guys know what audit is. Audit is something, it's, it's, it's about security stuff. It's, it's mostly what um, like these big companies and NSA and things like that use to um, ensure that security decisions are properly logged and you can always figure out what's exactly going on in the system. It's kind of a log, it's a very specialized log and we um, uh, pull that into the journal as well. The kernel log buffer, basically everything the log, uh, kernel logs itself, um, plus native applications that talk directly to, to the journal to provide journal with um, context information. Of course, these various sources have uh, various properties, like some of them are more simple and others are more verbose and things like that. But the goal here really is to collect everything that happens on the system, all kinds of logs, and centralize it in one place. Um, because we kind of reinvented logging here, we saw it okay, we have to, to update um, the way how logs are actually managed. So we decided to actually make logs structured. So it's not like it's on syslog that it's uh, a log message is simply a line uh, that if it's nice, it starts with a time and then is followed by a tag, which is usually a service name, and then comes with some English language text. Now we decided to make a structure a structure that can look like something like this. This is, this is basically one log record, which basically starts with message equals something, which is the English language text of, or whatever language text, uh, well, like human readable text, um, but can carry a lot of meta information. Here, just a couple of fields. In real life, there are actually many, many, many more fields um, uh, attached. Um, like in this one, for example, uh, it says, yeah, the message hello has been uh, printed by the code that is in that file at that line in that function, and then a little bit of metadata about um, the process that logged that has had a PID, the process ID um, 47. Uh, 11 and had the user ID zero and was that binary and was uh, uh, on that host name. That data is of course, it's just an example, it's completely fake, but uh, uh, just to give you an idea how the structured data looks like, it feels like if you're a Unix guy, you will recognize that that feels a little bit like an environment block, right, like a set of environment variables. Um, because we have structured data, we can actually use that to uh, um, attach implicit metadata to every message. Meaning we don't, we, we not only log the message itself, um, but we also log uh, metadata we automatically collect from the system and from the logging process and attach it to the to the log record. Uh, as we see that the the ones um, at the bottom that start with an underscore are these kind of um, uh, implicitly added metadata, right? Um, it's not the application that said I'm uh, PID 4711. It's actually um, uh, the journal that figured out that that message is coming from uh, PID 4711. Um, this metadata is fully indexed implicitly, right? So if we want to have all logs that have been generated by um, the process 4711, then you can just specify that and we'll actually show you, uh, like a good part of my demo is hopefully going to be um, a demo if I have the time to. So it will actually show, we will actually show you how you can filter for these things. So every metadata field is implicitly indexed. So if you want to filter by host name, you can do that. If you want to filter by exe, you can do that automatically. Um, this metadata is not um, just implicitly added and indexed, it's also trusted. 
Um, specifically meaning that if you, if you look at this stuff, the stuff that begins in the underscore is actually tells you that it's trusted information. Meaning, it's not the application that sent that to us, it is um, our journal D stuff, um, uh, code, that actually appended that information. And because journal D runs privileged, it can know um, that, like, you can know that this data could not be, not be faked. This is a, a real problem with classic syslog. Like, just think about that, that you have a, have a classic set, setup, you have an Apache and a MySQL running and somebody managed to exploit your Apache, right? And classic syslog, because all the messages are entirely generated on the sending side, um, uh, after the, the, the attacker exploited your Apache, it can send whatever message it likes to the syslog service, and the syslog service will just store it on disk. So if the attacker decides to claim it as MySQL, or claim that it's the init system, or claim something completely else, nobody will notice, and it will just um, hit the disk the way it is. This, of course, we, we always saw that that's a huge problem. We actually if you if we provide logging, there must be an element of trust in there so that you know that the information that is actually stored on disk is actually correct and gives you the right hints as long as the, as the logging system itself didn't get attacked and exploited. So um, yeah, again, the summary is basically everything that comes with an underscore is automatically attached by the journal and hence trustable and implicitly added. Everything that does not start with an underscore comes from the application itself hence cannot be trusted, and uh, um, yeah. Are there any requirements on the uh, data schema? Is it just a no, it's arbitrary key value uh, list? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually completely freeform. You can even send binary stuff. Um, it, it's actually supposed that you are, should be able to do that. Like, for example, if you have, write a hard disk demo and have smart data, or these kind of things, these, these binary blobs, you can totally attach them as a field. Um, but we generally recommend um, that if it's not inherently binary data, that you format it as ASCII. Um, and, and like, so that if you have a number, you just print it out as an ASCII string instead of um, sending the binary. There are no requirements to have a nope. message, for example. No. Everything there, um, well, I mean, if you do that, if you use specify message, um, uh, we, we have a, a man page basically, we suggest a couple of field names that you're supposed to use, and tools like journal control use that information to regenerate, for example, um, the classic syslog output from this data, right? Like, so that you, it will, like, if you use journal control like that, it will take this data and display it to you in a very traditional way, simply because it knows that the message part is the human readable thing, and so on and so on. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very free form. It's supposed to be very easy to use for, for developers. They can just can't come up with whatever they want. However, um, a couple of fields are well defined, documented, and in the syntax and everything. And if you decide to use them, use them. Um, okay, so there's so much about the, the metadata. Um, the primary interface for everybody um, working um, with a computer to the journal is journal control. Um, the journal control is actually a really powerful tool, and uh, most of my talk I actually wanted to spend on, on uh, giving an example how to use that. Journal control, if you just invoke it, will actually give you something I would like to call pixel perfect um, syslog style output. Meaning, um, if you just run it, it looks exactly how it would look if you would type um, cut varlog messages or cut varlog syslog, depending on the distributions um, from five years ago, right? So it will have this column of the date, host name, uh, so the tag, so which is service name, and the actual message. So that you cannot actually distinguish. But actually, um, even though it looks very similar, it's a little bit enriched. So um, I'll show that to you shortly. But it's uh, um, what you can look for if, you, if I actually demo that to you is that it's actually um, enriched with color, specifically meaning because um, uh, the journal actually stores um, uh, uh, priority information. Like uh, on classic syslog, every message that is logged actually comes with a priority, meaning if it's a debug message, if it's an important message, if it's just notice, if it's just informational or something like that, we actually store that information away. The classic syslog does not. Like varlog messages does not have any information about the priority anymore. But we use that information on display to actually um, uh, mark the lines that are errors or higher in red and the ones that are notice or higher in, in, in bright and everything else that's debug or just info in gray, which basically means just like that, um, you have a, a much nicer view on the, on, the, on the logs because you actually know um, if something's red, you should probably care about it and if it's not, you probably shouldn't. Um, so then another thing that um, uh, is, it does better than classic syslog, it's actually time zone adjusted. This is a real problem with classic syslog because classic syslog does not store any information about time zones, meaning um, it will always, um, the 
t time and date will be in the in the time zone that the sending machine, like the machine where the actual app ran on um, that locked it, had locally, which is fine as long as you only use it as a lo local logging system. But as soon as it, um, it, it comes to some other machine and is centralized um, across some cluster or something, um, you might have very weird data because you. Uh, unless you set everything to the UTC time zone, you might be really confused because some machines might run in UTC, others in Berlin time zone, and so on and so on. Because um, the journal actually stores the metadata and knows um, the original UTC times always. It will store those, and uh, if you display them, you get the local time uh, calculated at the presentation time. Um, then there's the other thing. The data that we collect and show you is actually always going to be complete. Specifically, this means in traditional syslog, you, you, the, the data is stored away was really the data that the program originally generated. And if the program originally didn't send a PID, or didn't send a service name, or, it, or didn't send a date, then there would not be a PID, a service name, or a date in the generated message. In fact, um, if you use the, the LibC um, uh, uh, syslog uh, functions, you actually have to turn on implicitly that you get the PID printed, right? So um, many services, um, uh, because of that reason, wouldn't include the PID uh, traditionally. However, in SystemD, in the SystemD journal, um, we put a big em emphasis on these implicit fields, and one of those implicit fields is that we always attach the PID, and that we always attach the time, that we always attach the host name, and that we always attach the service name. Hence, it will not happen anymore that there will be incomplete lines, because we just say, yeah, we add it in. And there's some form of decoration, by which I mean, um, you will see the normal log output like it looked in uh, Valog syslog, but it will add in a couple of lines. For example, and most interestingly, every time where a system reboot happened, it will add a line dash dash boot dash dash, because it knows um, from the meta information, this is where boot happened, maybe it should show it to you and not pretend that it was one stream without a boot. So, um, yeah. And uh, at this point, I will continue with uh, demoing, and I'm going to demo these, these wonderful commands. But uh, probably we should uh, have questions at this point, if anybody has any question at all. Where is the data, where is the journal stored? So the journal is uh, stored in var log, actually like traditional syslog, but it's in a var log journal, actually. And it's a binary format. Um, like you remember, like in the system discussion, this was much discussed uh, issue because people didn't really like that. But it's uh, because it's indexed. It's it's uh, um, in a binary format. The binary format is uh, documented. Like you can find it in the in the wiki. Um, it's uh, it's uh, like it's optimized for. It's mostly a format that is append only, but only mostly. Meaning that it's it's like a traditional syslog. You you just append stuff to the end, but this one is you append stuff to the end and then you link up a couple of things in the front, basically. So um, yeah, you find you find those log files there. Um, the journal works differently though than than classic um, syslog works because um, journal control will at display time take any number of journal files and merge them into a single stream. Right, it will interleave them nicely. So if you have uh, one journal file com coming from one host and another journal file from one uh, from another host, and you drop in the same directory and tell um, journal control to show you the content of that directory, then journal control will take all those files and generate one stream out of it and always show you, yeah, this one's from that at that point and so on and so on. So um, and uh, that's also the reason like tradition traditional syslog had these rotated uh, log files, right? Like um, when they got too old. Um, a journal doesn't have that anymore. Um, it just has archived uh, log files and will always um, show you the entire thing, whatever it has. And it, it will implicitly decompress if it needs to and things like that. Um, any other question at this point? Oh, oh, sorry. Let's do that one first. Um, so um, the journal D comes with Linux, with Linux systems these days, so um, it's not a component you can install on top. So either you have the journal or you don't, but uh, it's really a question of the operating system. It's nothing like um, your operating system, your vendor, like Red Hat or SUSE or Debian or whoever, they have to build it into your operating system. Okay, but I mean, this is running for all the process, all the time. Yes. Well, I mean, so um, uh, the journal is, is, is designed so that everything's put, put in a big pool, and then you filter um, uh, while looking at it. 
right? So the idea is then that, yeah, you would throw it all in the journal. You don't care about um, spitting anything out at that point in time. But when you look at it, then you can say, now please show me everything from only this app. That all said, we do provide compatibility with classic syslog daemons because there's a lot of stuff we do not cover with a journal. Like, for example, a lot of people actually care about the classic journal network protocol, which is UDP, BSD, um, syslog uh, protocol. We don't cover that. If people want that, that's completely okay and that they should install um, a, a classic syslog implementation like syslog and ng or rsyslog and they um, uh, will get all the data that your journal gets will journal will forward to them automatically there's there's nothing you have to configure for that it would just work um, so um, basically if you want to have a specific stream uh, written to one specific file just go ahead and install classic syslog and you can get it and you don't even have to do anything special that's different from before. But again, I, I would recommend you to look at it from the other way around and actually um, filter at display time and not at, at uh, collection time. Um. How often do you flush the, uh, the, the journal? So, um, I'm sure that uh, uh, I don't know, by, uh, a kernel oops or something, what is in the, in the journal? Um, so um, we uh, flush um, on certain conditions, like for example, I think every minute or something after the last write, every so and so uh, many megabytes of, of uh, logs we collected, uh, and there are a couple of other conditions. And I think there's also, if there is at least one log message at log level emergency or higher, we immediately flush. So um, I, I can't tell you all the rules that there are, but there are basically a couple of rules where we thought, okay, this is a good reason um, we have to flush now. If we would flush all the time, of course, the system would be crawling, um, but we f try to figure out um, um, things. Also, we, f we flush when we become idle, right? When there's nothing else to do on the system, then we just say, okay, now flush everything to disk. Um, yeah. Okay, um, no further questions at this time. How much time do I have left? Um, okay, then it's demo time. Um, so, let's actually invoke, can you actually read that? Shall I increase the font even further? Um, if we invoke journal control like this, this is what we get. Um, what you see here, actually, it's kind of the output that you know from uh, classic syslog, as mentioned. It really looks like Varlog messages. Um, one nice thing you see here is it actually does auto-paging, um, so it automatically invoked that in less, um, because that's how I do paging. Um, this is kind of something we, we adopted from, from Git does it these days. I know that some people don't like it, but I like it, so it stays. Um, but it basically means that you can just start scrolling here around. Of course, it starts with the oldest data. In this case, it's uh, February 11. I think it's actually, yeah, it's February 11, like, uh, it's a long time ago. This is basically like Valog messages, which start as the oldest. But, uh, yeah, you see all the output here in this case from the kernel. What's interesting here, you see that this one, the Linux version thing is in bold, um, uh, like this line here. Uh, this is because the kernel, for some reason, decided to log that at a higher log level because it considered that the most important thing in the world that you know which Linux version that is. Um, but yeah, you see, like uh, a lot of things are just boring, but some things are, are bold, which are the ones where the kernel thought uh, set the higher log level on. Um, let's actually look for something red, which tells you that something's an error here. This, for example, RPC bind actually um, found an error here, so it um, logged this in red. So it looks exactly like uh, syslog does, except that you saw the color already, that you saw the fact that it's uh, auto-paging. Uh, what we can also see is that, uh, uh, I'm actually trying to show you the, uh, this all doesn't look that nice. Um, I wanted to show you the way I wear boots. Um, how do I do that the best way? Uh, I have too much info. oh, there you. See, if there's a reboot, you see uh, um, this line there with the reboot, right? Because uh, it, I, it was uh, 10 o'clock in the evening and then I rebooted and, and when it came back it was 11.15. So um, you saw some ways how it's enriched. Again, you, this um, date that is shown there is always time zone uh, corrected. Okay, so that's pretty interesting but also kind of boring because it, sure it's, it's small um, improvements but it's not a big thing. Let's actually start uh, with the fancy stuff. Okay, um, these are a couple of commands we will execute now. Journal control dash n. Um, as you might guess, um, one of the most commonly used commands. Let's. I'm sorry, um, the declaration. There are red lines. 
For example, I get uh, that the audio is not uh, established, well established. But later in the log, the line says that audio is uh, okay. But this is not printed in red. This is annoying. Yeah, but it's a bug in the, in the individual application. Like basically, um, whatever the application gives us as a priority value, we'll, we will store and use for the coloring. And if an application, and there are applications like that, decide that everything is uh, of the utmost important nature and is always emergency level or higher, then we will store that away. So, and then everything will show red. But it's really an, uh, something you have to file a bug against to the individual application, ask them please don't claim that your uh, warnings are more important or less important than they actually are. Um, so coming back to that, uh, if you are a Linux uh, user administrator and you look at the logs, then one of the most commonly used commands um, is tail-n, right, on var log messages. We have a counterpart, that's journal control-n. Uh, what it does basically, it shows you um, the specified number of lines, right? If you say seven, that's what we get. Okay, see, I was debugging something here. That's what you get there. Uh, you get the last seven lines of, of uh, logs here. Um, you, of course, you can specify any number you want. Like, if you want 20, you get 20. Um, next command is general control dash F, right? Uh, we already talked that tail dash n is a pretty frequent command on classic syslog logging. Tail dash f is another one, which basically allows you to show me the last uh, so and so many log lines and follow the output with everything that's happening. If we do that here, we can do that journal control dash f and it does exactly that. Now everything um, stops here because nothing is locked at this moment. But if we do that, I'm here actually on a, on a development system, so I hope this all works fine because uh, I'm actually debugging something here. That, so, uh, but anyway, I use the logger command in that window. Let me actually show that properly. So I invoked logger, and uh, what you saw that it immediately showed up in the other output there. Um, general control dash B is actually something that is uh, something that system five, uh, like the, the, the classic syslog, cannot provide you with. It actually will show you the logs from uh, the current boot. So you do journal control dash B, uh, journal control dash B, and we'll start with the current boot here, May 5th, um, and then goes, you can scroll as far down as you want. Uh, so this is actually pretty cool, but often if you want to debug something, you don't actually care about the stuff from this boot, but from the stuff of the last boot. So you can actually do that too. You specify uh, journal control um, dash B minus one, and we'll go one boot back. And that was at uh, three eight, and you can do minus two, and you go, that's my boot from yesterday, and so on and so on. You can actually do dash dash list boots, and we'll show you the boots that are currently available. Like you see the number down there, zero is always the current boot, minus one is the previous one, and so on and so on, and we'll tell you exactly how often you use your computer. So, so if you have to do a tally for your employer when you use your computer, you can actually use that data. Um, can you also look into the future? <laughs> sure, of course. <laughs> actually, you can, but uh, of course, you usually, like, you can do that, and it's actually sometimes useful um, if you um, have data from some a system that is, uh, um, uh, has wrong clock, and you can take them here, and you can actually do that. So, but of course, it doesn't really make much sense. Um, there's journal control dash E. Journal control dash E is one of the really most useful commands. It actually gives you um, the last uh, 1,000 log lines, the, uh, la uh, the most recent uh, 1,000 log lines, and puts you at the end of less. So it's actually the command that you almost always want to use because it just gives you what just happened, right? Um, there's journal control dash R. Journal control dash R gives you everything in reverse order. So you see the, the, the most recent stuff at the top and the oldest stuff at the end. Also really useful command. Uh, journal control dash K gives you everything from the kernel, right? So this is not, doesn't look much different from the dash B output because now you only see kernel stuff and that's what it usually starts with. But uh, now you only see the kernel stuff. It's kind of like typing DMESC. You can now type journal dash K. Um, this one is interesting. Journal control dash U. Journal control dash U basically allows you to get all the output from a specific service on the system. So let's say I want to see everything from Avahi. Uh, 
Um, that's command line completion, by the way. So everything from Avahi, I can type this. Uh, German control dash u Avahi daemon. And see there, I get all the output exactly from Avahi. And it's quick, because it's all indexed, and implicitly all this meta information that something is from Avahi is used. Um, I can also uh, filter by log level. So um, often it's only interesting to actually see the errors that happened on the system because you don't actually care about the debug uh, output. So you type this, and it basically will give you everything error and uh, 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 more important than error. So in this case, you see a lot of red, of course, because that's how we show you that stuff. Um, among other stuff, by the way, what's kind of related to this is um, if you run systemd, it will automatically add all core dumps as simple logable events to the logs. So that's what you see here, actually, where the xorg dumped core, and you see automatically the core dump generated there. Um, you can automatically filter by time, right? So um, we try to come up with a very obvious syntax for that. So you can write stuff like this. Journal control since today. What does it do? What would you guess? It shows you the log starting um, today at zero uh, hours. And that's where it starts, and then you know when I uh, woke up today because that's the first time I unsuspended my machine. Local time zone. Local time zone. Um, but you can actually write things like uh, uh, actually you can say I want something on 2016 uh, for um, seven. Then you have everything since 7th of April, and if you do that, that's when it starts logging, right? Um, and you, it's a pretty obvious syntax, actually, and if you want to check the man page, you want to know the exact details. And your question is probably going to be, um, can you also do this? And you can, of course. So, yeah. But, of course, there will not going to be anything. Um, of course, there's also um, the opposite, which is until. Um, so you can say, give me everything until that date. And you can say, from that date until that date. I think I don't have to show that now. Um, that's already pretty cool because you can filter these things, but it gets better. You can actually filter for all the fields that I showed you earlier. So, and there's tab completion. That, that, that's where it really becomes nice because now I just type journal control. I should probably should type that properly. And if I press tab now, it gives me a list of the fields that I can match for. So, um, uh, I kind of already showed a couple in this earlier slide. Like there's, for example, the uh, underscore UAD um, one. So I type that and say, give me every output that was generated with that field set. Basically everything coming from UAD, whatever I specify now. Now again, I have tab completion. If I press tab now, it gives me um, the UIDs that are currently uh, used in any log line on my local system. And that's actually not that many, right? This is basically one UID for all system services plus mine. So if I want, um, I don't know what that is actually, what UID 70 is, but if I want everything from uh, uh, UID 70, then I type this, oh, I actually hit the Avahi again. Um, that's actually from the Avahi user, so I get exactly the output from the Avahi user. But I can take anything else, like 81, this is basic DBus is um, user ID 81. And uh, you can uh, basically use any kind of filter here, like any field you like. Like if you want to have everything that's generated, like, uh, from a specific, um, from a specific uh, piece of code, and I can actually say this, and it will actually um, uh, do tab completion, show me a couple of functions that have logged on the system. These are C functions, right? This is the feature that depends on the, on the application. They actually have to send this data along. Not all applications do. But in this case, we see a lot of stuff that runs inside of systemd, sends it along, and, and, and all of that is network manager. It sends that information along too. So, um, yeah, if I want to see everything that the function called nm, or that a function called nm manager start did, here we go. There you see it. You can also combine these. Um, it's really simple to combine them. You just specify multiple of them space separated. Um, so you can actually lock things, uh, things down pretty nicely. You can combine them also with seeking for times and dates. You can um, uh, combine them with seeking for, for priorities and these kind of things. Um, Sometimes you want to do it the other way around. You don't want to filter by some field, but you just want to see what is the precise field for that record. For that, journal control has a couple of different output modes. We already saw the default output mode, which looks exactly like classic syslog, but there are a couple others. Uh, one interesting one is verbose. If you use that, 
you see um, it, it doesn't look as pretty, but it gives you the full record that is stored there. So this is the, the first uh, log um, uh, record that we have, and these are all the values that are set, right? If you look at this, you see the first method was runtime journal is using 8.0. If we use a more traditional um, mode, right, the default mode, then you see, yeah, the same line, runtime journal is using, and so on. So, um, but here you see that there's a lot of meta information stored with that, like the host name, there's a UUID identifying the machine, a UUID uh, that's assigned by the kernel for the boot, there's a couple of system D organizational stuff, there's the effective capabilities, there's the full command line of the process that logs, there's the full uh, pass to the binary, which are two different things, the com field, which is like the task name of the kernel, the group ID, the user ID, the process ID. In this case, there's also a message ID. Message IDs are something that applications can use to uniquely identify one type of message so that you can recognize it. Um, like, for example, um, I mentioned this thing where query dumps have become normal loggable events. Uh, for core dumps, we have to find one of these UIDs. So if you want to um, ask the system, give me all core dumps that happened on the system, you can just go to the journal and ask, give me all the fields that match this, um, this line, uh, this uh, field here. Uh, give me all the records that match this field. Let's do that. We just uh, do this. And now, OK, this is not the core dump stuff, but this is like this uh, information from, from the journal where it stores um, outputs information about how much it's actually going to use on disk. Um, yeah, here a couple of more examples of what you can match for. Um, the PID, the COM field, and the, the, the last line actually combines two things, where you basically say, give me everything from PID1 from that host name called Delta. Um, this is pretty much everything I have on my slides for now, but maybe we have a minute or so, two minutes for more questions, or maybe you want to see some demo, some command line that I shall type, or something like that. And there's some other output formats, uh, for example, like JSON or something like that? Yes, there are. Like if we press tap here, we see there is JSON. And if we do that, um, it looks like this, and there's basically one JSON object per line, and it carries the very same information. Um, there's also JSON pretty, which is the same thing, but has new lines so that you can actually look at it. Sorry? Um. Oh, really? <laughs> hmm. yeah. Nobody complains so far, and I know that people are using that, so that's weird. <laughs> Um, there are a couple of other output modes, like for example, sometimes, um, no, this is short is the normal one, but sometimes you want short monotonic, which will give you not calendar time, but uh, simply um, um, time starting from, from uh, the boot and things like that. Um, yeah, it's actually pretty interesting, the output modes that there are. There's also export, which is a binary format, uh, which allows you to, to dump the entire journal with all its data in a binary uh, serialization, and then you can um, uh, import that somewhere else. How do you truncate uh, the log data, the, the, the journal data? Like you want to throw stuff away? Um, so there's a command called, uh, so journal control, by the way, I, I, I put um, those lines on the slide. These are not at all everything that you can do with a journal. There's a lot more, but it's just the introduction of what you can do with it. Now, what you're asking for is there is uh, dash dash vacuum, dash dash vacuum and vacuum. That's actually a third one now. It basically allows you to, to um, throw away old stuff, um, and you can sp specify either a size where the size uh, indicates how much you want to have, uh, like how much disk, uh, how much you want to use the journal up on disk after the vacuuming completed, right? So you can say um, vacuum size uh, equals 500 megabytes, and then basically we'll throw, up, uh, throw away everything until um, uh, you only get the 500 megabytes left. You can also specify zero, and then we'll throw away everything. Um, and you can combine that or just use vacuum time where you basically say, um, if you do like, uh, five weeks, you could, well, that's uh, the working command that will basically throw away everything that's older than five weeks. And there's another one uh, now, another way to vacuum. I don't even know what it use anymore. Um, but yeah, these are all the commands that there's. Um, files, oh yeah, uh, basically the journal um, splits up things into individual files and you can specify, I want only three files left and then everything else is uh, thrown away. But I think that's uh, the end of the time. If you have any further questions, um, I'll be around for a little bit longer and uh, thank you very much. Especially those who asked the questions. Um, you and you and you, is there anything? And uh, I hope this was useful.
Oh, and what I wanted to say is that next is Chris, and he actually shows some journal integration into Rocket, and it's